as long as we have perverted vision. Thinking is perverted as long as our thinking is confused. According to the Buddhist analysis of the human response to the external world, depends on the kind of stimulation received. The external world consists of things that naturally are found to be very pleasant. There are material forms, sounds, tastes and smells that we find in the very constitution of our being to be very pleasant. But there is another aspect to the external reality. There are other things that we find due to the very nature of our constitution to be displeasing and unpleasant. So we have a natural resentment to that which is unpleasant and natural attraction towards that which is pleasant. We are attracted to what is beautiful, what gives us enjoyment and pleasure, and repelled by what is unpleasant and that which we think is undesirable. So this is what creates what Buddhism calls a hateful response to our environment on the one hand, or a craving response on the other hand, to whatever we find to be pleasant. These attitudes of craving and hatred are what Buddhism calls the two basic roots of moral evil, lobha and dosa, greed and craving, to the things that give us pleasure, and hatred against the things that we don't find pleasant. These two responses rule our life because we lack insight into the nature of things. What is expected in Buddhist meditation is cultivation of insight when we are confronted with these situations in which we interact with the external world through our senses. We should be able to see things as they really come to be without the distortions that the mind brings into them, without the ideas of nietzsche, permanence, sukha, pleasure, atta, ownership, anicca, dukkha and anatta are the real nature of things. If we see everything that excites us into these emotional frames of mind, if we see them in the proper perspective, they can be seen as impermanent and transient, resulting in suffering, in pain and sorrow, if we crave to them and cling to them. We should be able to see that none of them has substantial reality and none of them can be owned by us forever. They have the characteristic of being impermanent and transient. They have the characteristic of producing suffering. They have the characteristic of lacking in substance or stability. But yet we cling to them as things that are permanent, things that will give us stable satisfaction, and things that we can possess forever. This is the change in attitude that Buddhism seems to bring about by the culture of the mind. And mental culture in Buddhism involves the cultivation of a certain psychological potential that we have. The key to overcoming this tendency of the mind to react in an unenlightened way is to develop what Buddhism calls mindfulness. Therefore, in the Buddhist culture of the mind, mindfulness is recognized as one of the most significant faculties of the mind that can be developed. Mindfulness is considered as the first factor of enlightenment. The Buddha says that when you look at the influxes or the mechanical flow of corruptions, the only mental power that can check this is mindfulness. Yani sotani lokasmi sati te sang nivarana. The unwholesome currents flow mechanically into our mind and the only faculty of the mind that can prevent this, that can check this, is supposed to be mindfulness. Mindfulness is the faculty that can observe 
the various principles underlying the functioning of our mind. Mindfulness can understand the hindrances that affect our mind, observe them and find the kind of cause and effect relationships that work within ourselves. When mindfulness is cultivated, it is possible to develop the second factor of enlightenment called Dhamma Vichaya, that is inquiry into the principles that work within us. When the ability to see the principles that operate in our mind is cultivated, we can put more and more effort to progress speedily towards liberating the mind from unwholesome qualities. This exercise in the meditative culture of the mind gradually frees the mind from disturbing feelings of mind and produces intrinsic joy. Buddhism focuses attention on the great spiritual joy that springs out of this liberating exercise that we venture into. Another factor that grows in a person who ventures into the path of mental culture is piti, that is, that occurs with the initial calming of the mind and body. This promotes mental composure called samadhi and finally the equanimity which is required to understand things in their proper perspective. Those are the seven factors of enlightenment which we cultivate in Buddhist meditation. This process is referred to as bhavedi because you cultivate them or make those mental qualities grow in your personality. It involves the use of human choice and freedom to overcome the mechanistic nature of human living. The wise person does not allow mechanical processes to take over, but uses choice and freedom to direct and cultivate our mind and develop these wholesome qualities of the mind. The Buddhist practices of calming the mind are adopted with the final intention of developing insight, with the intention of understanding the nature of things. When the mind is calmed, we do not become open to the corruptions that usually flow into us in our day-to-day -day life. The solution that Buddhism seeks is not a temporary calming of the mind. What Buddhism seeks is not an interim state of experience, which makes us think that we have solved our problems by moving away from the real world into an artificial world created under artificial conditions. When a person liberates one's mind in the Buddhist way, the understanding is that one can lead an undisturbed life in the waking world without letting corruptions set in. That is the ultimate goal of the Buddhist path of meditation practice. It should be noted that this is a graduated path and that one cannot achieve the full results in haste. It is a graduated path and what I want to emphasize here is that the more you reduce craving and hatred, the happier you will become. There are degrees in this process of growth there are degrees in this process of mental culture. Through the practice of mental culture, you might achieve a certain degree of growth and eliminate a certain degree of unhappiness or unsatisfactoriness in your life. There is also an ideal which Buddhism describes as the incomparable liberation of the mind and liberation through insight. Anuttarang cheto vimutin panya vimutin. The incomparable liberation through insight and wisdom is the ultimate goal. But we progress towards this goal in gradual stages. Each stage of progression is marked by reduction of sorrow and mental insanity. Buddhist meditation is not mere contemplation, not resorting to some kind of artificial living. It is not living in solitary confinement. 
but is an attempt to cultivate your own responsibility in handling the affairs of the world. It may be useful even in the day-to-day -day life of the person to develop this notion of responsibility, choice, freedom and understanding. I think those are the main principles of Buddhist meditation.